we haven't had our usual PowerPoint up and running, but I just want to make sure that we take a moment to thank our sponsors, um, some of whom are here today. We also have some housekeeping to do specifically. Uh, we have feedback as usual. Uh, they're located on or in your uh, information packets, but there's also a QR code that you can scan to fill out the feedback online. Uh, student attendance, there are vouchers at the east exit doors, which are over here, and upstairs over here. Make sure you get your attendance voucher so you actually get credit for being here if you need it. Um, there's Wi-Fi information in your attendance packet, and there is a charging station back here to your right. And uh, if we have anyone listening online, you might want to go to UFTV Productions on YouTube and check out the live stream there. It uh, might give you easy access to the video and audio to participate. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and welcome uh, Dr. Catherine Fell to the stage to give us some words and introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Lynn, for that wonderful leadership. I 
And I know that this year you are joined by Highland Insurance. So we want to thank Highland Insurance for your leadership in this forum today. Thank you for what you're doing. A couple of electeds here uh, who I owe a great deal to. First of all, our auditor, our county auditor, Cherry Rushmore. Cherry, will you stand up? Can we thank Cherry for her public service, auditor for the county. And then a close friend of mine who I actually owe to the uh, start of my political career. Uh, because he made the wise decision to go from city treasurer to county treasurer, and then I became the city treasurer for the city of Finlay. That's my friend and colleague, Steve Wong. Steve, will you stand? Let's thank Steve for his public service. It's just wonderful to be here with you today, and I'm so pleased to be able to make some opening remarks for your forum. Uh, as you know, October is Cybersecurity Month. And uh, just in talking with Lynn very briefly as we were preparing for this, she said, Robert, she said, I think that this topic is more pertinent now than it ever has been with the coronavirus, more people working from home. And obviously the surface area for attacks widening. So I'm so pleased to be here with you today. I'm going to make some remarks about cybersecurity and a little bit about the treasurer's office. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit about how we've responded to the coronavirus, talk with you about opportunities that we see on the horizon, and then about some new programs that are coming out of the treasurer's office as we emerge from the coronavirus. And as we, take, as we look at October being Cybersecurity Awareness, Awareness Month, there's no better time than to learn as an organization how to prevent these cyber attacks and respond to these cyber attacks. Uh, you know, a century ago, the state treasurer's office was entirely manual. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was beginning in the treasurer's office, I met one gentleman who uh, actually claimed that he chopped off part of a tip of a finger using the bond coupon machine in the basement of the treasury. Uh, that was when we used to clip bond coupons and have to mail them back in in order to get that money for the investments from the treasurer's office. But today, we consist of 125 professionals. We manage the state's $29 billion investment portfolio, consisting both of our local and government pool, uh, Star Ohio account, as well as the uh, Treasury investment pool, both our long and short-term pool, and our $11 billion debt portfolio. And as well, we collect and deposit, and as well, we distribute uh, about $68 billion a year in state revenues and expenditures. And guess what? We're doing it now all electronically. Needless to say, cyber, cyber security is now at the core of our work, and everything we can do to stay one step ahead is important in the Treasury. Over the past two years, uh, we've done a couple of things with a special focus on making necessary upgrades to our IT infrastructure and our websites. So uh, you probably haven't noticed, uh, I know that you probably don't go to the state uh, treasury website every day, uh, but if you visited the website we, uh, recently, it's www.ohiotreasurer.gov, you might notice that uh, as of this summer we have a brand new look. We've replaced a legacy system almost a decade old uh, and as the saying goes, it's not just a pretty face either. Uh, under there, we've uh, made it more difficult for bad actors to interfere with the people's work, and we've enhanced our security on that particular website. Additionally, uh, earlier in the summer, we unveiled a brand new site for our ohiocheckbook.gov website. Now, this is a really good website where you can actually go and you can log in today and you can see what all the transactions were, all the expenses for the state of Ohio last week. It's our way of making sure that we are accountable to you, the taxpayers of the state of Ohio, for what we're doing. You go log in, you see anybody's salary, you can see the vouchers that we made last week, all the expenditures of the state, it's all available uh, on the Ohio checkbook. And this site really brings transparency to your fingertips as citizens of the state of Ohio. We've got a fresh look. You've got to see this GUI interface. It is fantastic. Our team did a really nice job. Uh, so you've got to check it out. And we've actually updated some security features on this site, too, because we want to make sure that 
the Ohio checkbook remains a trusted resource for taxpayers for years to come. These are some of the things that we've done behind the scenes uh, and also some things that you as the public can see, but there's a lot more work that we have to do. And we are doing everything we can to protect the office uh, and the countless number of transactions that we have from cybersecurity attacks. But as we all know, preparation is the key. And I know that that's why you're here today. Like President Kennedy said during one of his State of the Union speeches, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. So the first step is prevention. As we all know, we find that the end user is the easiest and most vulnerable target for these cyber attacks. That's why an educated workforce is one of the best defenses that we can have against cyber attacks. In the treasurer's office, we have annual cybersecurity training. It's a requirement for each employee, and that, cha that training changes every year. And I can tell you it's pretty robust. It takes me about, I think, three and a half hours to go through that cybersecurity training. It covers a wide spectrum of topics, including phishing and ransomware. But we're always looking for ways to do more. Now, the next layer of protection is a well-developed and formalized incident response plan. This is important not only for the IT department, but also for the organization as a whole. You know, if there's a plan in place, uh, terrible events like ransomware will be less disruptive, less disruptive, uh, because everybody knows their part and everybody has a script to follow. You know, I remember uh, just being part of the city of Finley when we had the 100-year flood. Uh, it was on August 20th of 2007, just off the top of my head, and uh, I can remember vividly uh, getting the call from Spring Lake. Anybody here from Spring Lake? Uh, we had a terrified house owner from Spring Lake that called the City of Finlay Call Center that morning in the mayor's conference room and said, there is a wall of water three feet high approaching my house. What do I do? And uh, I remember a couple months earlier, as the city auditor, I attended the incident command center response training plan in the fire department. I walked in the back and the fire, the fire personnel, they turned around, they're like, what is this suit doing here? You know, why is he here, right? And what I learned in that incident response training was that as the financial professional, I really did, I needed to stay out of the way, which was good because the fire chief took over that incident response. And to the city of Finley's credit, under the chief Lanyo and his battalion commanders, not a single life was lost during the flood. So they did a fantastic job, and it's just like that with ransomware. When you're responding to these incidents, it's helpful to know what everybody's role is up front. We want to create a strong backup and recovery plan that considers ransomware. And I know that's the talk of, topic of your forum today. And then you got to test that plan regularly, at least once a year. And when it comes to data, obviously data is a necessity and more of it's going into the cloud, but uh, it can also become a liability. And we, one of the things that we focus on in the treasurer's office and in, in something that our legal department literally reviews something on this, it seems like every single week is our CPI, our confidential personal information that we hold about people in the treasurer's office. And we are very sensitive to that. So, old data should be archived and ultimately destroyed when its value is diminished. Regular maintenance is the key. We want to develop a continuous review schedule and ensure that our security systems are reporting and working properly. So have your internal teams do regular per perimeter checks, at least quarterly, because we all have blind spots and we have them in the treasurer's office too. Uh, one of the things that we have found is if you have third parties to perform penetration testing at least once a year, that's a great investment in your security. And in fact, if you can afford it, it's good to have a third party vendor that specializes in these areas. And they can either be on retainer or engaged in the organization on a fee for service basis. But we know that we can't all be experts at everything, and sometimes it's great to have those professionals one phone call away. 
Our funds are limited, and augmenting our IT shop with a third party we found is a great way to strengthen the team at a great price point. But at the end of the day, having a good cyber security insurance plan is one of the best investments that you can make. And in the Treasurer's Office, we're continuously learning the latest techniques to fight ransomware and cyber attacks to protect Ohio taxpayers. I want to tell you about some of the things that we've experienced during a different kind of virus attack, the coronavirus. Early in March, the Treasurer's Office looked at the markets, and at the end of March, we realized that the credit markets began to dislocate for some of Ohio's biggest institutions. Unfortunately, these institutions were also the ones that were key in responding to the coronavirus. It was some of our biggest hospitals in the state. Their borrowing costs in a matter of two weeks went from about 1.3% on the short end of the yield curve to over 8% as the money market, credit markets dislocated. Our team was able to jump in and we created a program of almost $750 million to purchase some of that short-term debt, be able to use our balance sheet to enter the market. We got a great return for you as taxpayers of the state in great, solid institutions that are helping the state of Ohio and our long-term good credit risks. And at the same time, we brought down significantly the borrowing costs for our large hospital systems in the state and allowed them to run to the front line of responding to the coronavirus. We then said, how can we bring some of our dollars that are parked in Washington, D.C. or New York City, how do we bring those back to the state of Ohio? Because we know if we put a deposit into a local Ohio bank, they'll loan money to small businesses. And so we created a negotiated deposit program for the state of Ohio where we could bring back deposits, taxpayer money for Ohioans, and invest it here in the state of Ohio. I want to talk with you briefly also about our stable account. I mention this at every program because in every crowd there's a, a father or a mother or a grandfather or grandmother that has a child with a disability. And the stable account program is terrific and you probably don't know this, but if you have someone with a disability, the state of Ohio will, uh, according to the Medicaid rules, take away the benefits, the medical benefits for that individual if they have more than $2,000 in their name. This discourages people from being independent, and getting out and working. It also discourages mom and dad or grandmother and grandfather from making an investment in that child's future. So we have the Ohio Stable Account Program which allows individuals to put up to $15,000 a year. Uh, well, I may have that statistic slightly wrong. Maybe it's $12,500 a year. But it allows you to put money into this account, and you can go out and work and live your life and be responsible for your own choices and your own money. It's a terrific program. When we started the Treasurer's Office, we had about 9,500 accounts uh, in our stable account program. I'm pleased to announce today that we believe we will end the year with over 20,000 accounts. The reason that's important to me, and I'm very proud of it, is because every one of those accounts represents an individual and in a family that we're able to help through the treasurer's office in this program. Final thing I wanted to share with you today is that as our state moved forward, um, it's no secret that whether you're a county or a city, a township, local government, or even the state of Ohio, there are going to be budget challenges on the horizon for us. And one of the things that we feel that we need to do is bring fresh bread to the table to deal with new problems for the state of Ohio and create innovative solutions for public policy areas to create the latest and greatest solutions for some of Ohio's biggest problems. Every dollar counts in this next budget, and we want to make sure that it's spent effectively on programs that work. And that's why in the Treasury, we have a new program called Results Ohio. It's the first of its kind in the country. Uh, we are creating a public-private partnership where we turn to private organizations, typically nonprofits, and we ask them what some of the solutions are that they can bring to the table for Ohio's issues. They run a pilot program with private money. If the program works, then at the end of that pilot program, 
we pay that nonprofit organization back for that pilot program. We reimburse them for their costs. It's a great way for us to encourage innovation in different public policy areas at a time when every dollar is going to count. So with that, I wanted to tell you that in conclusion, our mission in the Ohio Treasurer's Office is to be trusted stewards of Ohio's taxpayer dollars, to be wise investors in Ohio's future, and to be bold innovators for the citizens of the state of Ohio. And this conference is critical, and this issue is critical for us to be able to fulfill our mission for the Treasury of the state of Ohio. So thank you very much. I've enjoyed being here with you today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I would just like to th say thank goodness, uh, because uh, if you were going to expect me to answer some detailed cybersecurity question, I was going to have to pull Lynn Child up here on stage <laughs> for me. So, uh, Well, actually, I, I will ask a question sure. if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you've been very progressive as our treasurer, and I know we're starting to come out, hopefully, out of this pandemic. What sorts of things do you see that your office may do in the future to continue to move things forward? Well, thank you, Lana. The question was, what do you see that your office can do in the future to move things forward as we emerge out of this coronavirus pandemic? And I think that the first thing that we all need to do is, look, I think all of us are tiring of the coronavirus, but we cannot give up fighting. I was just saying to Alex uh, the other day in my office, I said, you know, I think we've taken the wrong approach internally. I've taken the wrong approach with the coronavirus. Sometimes I treat it like something that's happening to me. And I don't necessarily think about how I'm going to fight it and how I'm going to win. How I'm going to change what I'm doing to adapt to my new reality so that I can continue to come out and be with you today here at this event. What can I do to adapt what we're doing in the office and what I'm doing personally to deal with and win against the coronavirus? And I think that's the type of attitude that we also bring to the treasurer's office. We want to introduce new good public policy uh, and have this innovation occur in the nonprofit sector. We're not policy makers in the treasurer's office. We're fiduciaries. We have a ministerial role. But we truly believe that if we create this link between the nonprofit community and the private sector and the General Assembly and the appropriating authority, whether it's at the county level, uh, counties could set up these type of pay for success projects. The state level, through the General Assembly and the governor's office, or even the federal level, that you know, they need uh, significant help on federal policies as well. Uh, we believe that that innovation will be brought forward. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, as a state, this would be a great time for us to invest in our infrastructure on a go-forward basis. You know, nothing is more important. I'll tell you, you know, here in Northwest Ohio, we are truly blessed. I was talking with Highland Insurance, and I said, why are my, why are my homeowners' rates going up? Uh, not a criticism, but why are they going up? They said, well, you know, we just had, you know, we had a, a billion dollars, I guess, in, uh, in, in forest fires, another billion dollars in expenses because of the uh, peaceful uh, protests that happened around the country this summer. Uh, there's just a lot of liability uh, that has happened, a lot of damage, the forest fires, um, and these things all, all cost. And so, obviously, as they're looking at that risk, um, we want to be mindful that every investment that we make on a go-forward basis in infrastructure, and just ask the state of California if infrastructure is important, particularly in their electrical grid that seems to be starting some of these forest fires. Uh, the more investments that we can make in infrastructure, the better. In Northwest Ohio, we are blessed. We are blessed with great infrastructure, great electric infrastructure, great water and sewer infrastructure. Um, probably need some flood mitigation infrastructure still. Uh, 
uh, but we're working on that. We're going to get that problem solved. Uh, but if you go to Southeast Ohio and you ask them what some of their things are that their community needs, they'll tell you, we'd like to have a new sewer plant. We'd like to be able to extend water lines to be able to build new homes in our communities. We don't have access to broadband service, which as we know, over the last six months is one of the most critical things that we've all been able to use if, if you're working remotely or you're trying to process transactions remotely. So these infrastructure investments are critical for the future of our state. And at the same time, if you look at the credit market, we were into the uh, market over the last month um, with 10-year paper below 1% total interest cost. Below 1%. Anybody want to loan for 1%? What do you think? No, nobody? You're, you're, you're okay? Um, I'll tell you what, we're not going to see these kind of interest rates again, perhaps in my lifetime. It's unbelievable. And when the Federal Reserve pushes $2 trillion into the monetary base, uh, this, is, this, is, this is where interest rates go. I mean, they've hit a floor. So at the same time that we need infrastructure, we also have the ability to access capital markets at unbelievably historically low rates. So I think that's something else that can help us. And then I think the third thing is that as a state, we've got to focus on the areas where we win. And so we win in a lot of different areas. Uh, up here in Northwest Ohio, we still know how to make things with our hands. We still know how to make things. And as our supply chains reorganize, which they're going to be forced to do, I think they're going to bring manufacturing not just back to the United States, but back to Ohio. So that's number one. We've got to prepare for that. I think secondly, we've got to focus on industries that we have a relative strength in. I don't know if you saw this in the uh, journal yesterday, but did you see where China is now putting sanctions on U.S. companies? Did you see this? So, and what company do they put sanctions on? Boeing, right? Because Boeing is selling uh, technology to, to Taiwan. Well, with the exception of Seattle, Washington, which is where Boeing is located, probably the second most prevalent area of the United States in terms of aerospace industry, knowledge, know-how, research and development, and the ability to produce things is, is in southwest Ohio, in that Dayton to Cincinnati corridor. GE has the most advanced jet engine in the world down there. Wright-Patterson Base uh, is an unbelievable facility. I don't know if any of you have toured wright Pat Air Force Base, but it is truly a state treasure. It's amazing, the technology that the Air Force is developing there. Um, and so we have a relative advantage. We've got to look for these areas where we have relative advantages is in, and we need to invest in them. Aerospace, and then on the east side of the state, natural gas. God has given us natural gas under our feet, uh, the likes of which other countries simply dream about. Uh, if you combine Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, you get the third largest natural gas producing nation on the face of the earth. That's something that California and North Carolina, where I went to school, and other places simply can't replicate. It's a unique strategic advantage. So, you know, we need to invest in the areas where we win on a go-forward basis, and I think that's how our state produces success as we emerge from the coronavirus. And of course, along the way, all of it has to be secured. And it all has to be secured. And it all, quite frankly, over the next 12 months, is probably all going to be done remotely. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Other questions? Anybody else have a question? If not, I'd like to ask one more. Mm -hmm. May I? I don't want to take the floor, though. Does somebody else have a question? I just recently saw that Governor DeWine indicated that he was giving a certain amount of additional dollars to like higher ed and restaurants, bars, different, different areas, different sectors. Operationally, I'm very curious. I'm thinking it's coming through your office for disbursement. How does that work and how does it get to folks like, you know, Charity and Steve and into the local cities and counties? Thank you. The question was uh, for the CARES Act money, which mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. money that the federal government gave us, uh, the states, uh, in Ohio, they gave us uh, $4.5 billion to respond to the coronavirus. The question was, how does that money get dispersed down to the counties, localities, and through the higher education initiatives and the other things that the governor announced last week? Um, and I think there's a couple of dual processes, uh, but you know, I happened to talk with Charity a little bit earlier. I mean, they've received, Hancock County's received significant allocation of CARES Act money. 
um, that is substantial and meaningful. Um, and uh, so that money has gone down from the Treasury to the local governments uh, in the last, what, six weeks or so has it been since you've received that? So in the last six weeks, they've made those allocations. All this money has to be used by the end of this year under the existing congressional authority. What would be very helpful, um, and I'll editorialize here just for a moment, would be if Congress were to come up with a compromise and allow us more flexibility as a state, and I think the local governments would agree with this, Charity and Steve speak up if you don't agree, but it will allow us more flexibility to use that money uh, for infrastructure, for investments in ourselves so that we could emerge from the coronavirus. And I'll give the governor a lot of credit here. One of the very innovative things he's done is he has set up and set aside $125 million for small business grants over the next uh, eight weeks here, or 12 weeks until the end of the year um, of $10,000 and under to try to help those small businesses at a time when the PPP money has run out but customers have not yet returned. Um, and that's a program that we have advocated for and, and uh, tried to help pull together rules with U.S. Treasury to make sure that they were CARES Act compliant. And I applaud the governor for stepping out and making this program a reality. It's going to be very exciting to see how it impacts our small businesses. Because look, at the end of the day, if you give a grant to a small business in Finley, Ohio, where are they going to spend that money? For the most part, they're going to spend it right here in the community. So not only are you helping a small business, you're also lifting our entire economy up in the state of Ohio. So it's a terrific program. There's other allocations out there for rent, rental assistance that they've announced, higher education allocation, I think K through 12 uh, as well. And uh, it's a good thing because our state needs a shot in the arm and, uh, and, and I know that we're gonna bounce back quickly from this. Are there any other questions? <coughs> All right, hearing none, I turn the floor back over to you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Treasurer Sprague. Uh, up next, we have a joint presentation from two very senior people in cybersecurity and in our community. I know they both have excellent experience. Uh, we will be covering the topic of ransomware realities and will you be in business tomorrow? Uh, the first of our two joint speakers is Dr. Lauren Wagner. He is uh, Centricom's Senior Executive of Risk and Engineering with 41 plus years of experience managing global networks and security. He has proven results and de uh, delivered, uh, and his deliveries have taken place in fast-paced, complex environments that have dema uh, demanded patience, persistence, and continuous improvement. Uh, he specializes in information assurance and security practices, policy development, risk assessment and management, and contract negotiations and cost containment. He holds a doctorate in information assurance from the Unity University of Fairfax. Joining him is Dr. Dennis Acuna, who is the owner and principal consultant of Digital GRC, LLC. He is an information systems and technology practitioner with 36 years of hands-on experience in the oil and gas industry, holding a doctorate in information systems from Dakota State University and currently teaches courses in information security and risk management for information systems and information technology management here at the University of Finley and also at the University of Toledo. Uh, he conducts original and empirical uh, research in the field of information assurance and presents his findings at industry and academic conferences and symposiums along with publications in peer-reviewed academic journals. Uh, he, as mentioned, he works as an independent information, information systems governance, risk management, and compliance consultant. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Dennis Acuna and Lauren Wagner. Got a little green. 
green light or does that mean it's on? <laughs> It's on. There, it came off. Uh, moment. Do I just have to, yeah, okay. I guess it depends on which way I've been in my head, right, whether you're going to hear me or not. Uh, anyway, good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Wagner, and I work with Centricom. And uh, joining me today is Dr. Dennis Acuna uh, with Digital G GRC. And uh, we're, we're going to be talking about, as the title says, the realities of ransomware. And, you know, over the last couple of years, I've probably given a similar type of talk to groups of people uh, talking about general cybersecurity and ransomware, but, to, but today this is getting to be, you know, uh, an even more serious problem than what a lot of organizations have faced in the past. And the, and the unfortunate reality of it is, is it's a largely a situation that, that can be avoided. I mean, there's never 100% in cybersecurity with anything. But uh, as you'll see from some of the information we're going to share, there are certain steps that an organization can take to help uh, avoid ransomware and, and, and mitigate those, those vulnerabilities. So we're going to start here. And Dennis and I are going to share the platform here through some of these slides. And that's the first one. And I'll turn it over to Dennis. So it's an interesting topic, ransomware, and it couldn't be more timely. If you've been following the news, there's been a lot in the news lately. And ransomware has been around for a while, a decade or more. But recently, it's ramped up. And uh, the title, Omnis, Omnius Premonition, is that uh, there are more ransomware attacks now than before. And what's interesting is on September 1st, the Gartner Research Group uh, published an article that said, yeah, by maybe by 2024, they saw the senior officers of a company, the CEOs, CIOs, perhaps being liable for any deaths that occurred because of uh, cyber physical type incidents. Okay. I'm not sure if uh, having depth there it goes. Yeah. So. Ransomware incidents are not just about business failure anymore or about loss of uh, systems for a day or two, perhaps an hour. You know, something we always talk about, oh, there was a glitch in the systems. Uh, part of that Gartner group talked about the possibility of a death in the future uh, due to unpatched systems. And this has happened in the past as far as systems. Uh, there have been malware known as Stuxnet and Triton or Trisis, which have actually attacked the safety systems or the operational technology systems in companies. It just so happens that uh, around sep September 11th, a patient did die at a hospital in Germany. So it was, again, this is all very timely. We had the article from Gartner, and then it was actually a patient died in Germany, Dusseldorf, Germany. They're not saying it was directly related to the attack, but uh, this was a woman who had gone to a hospital for a procedure. It just so happened that that hospital was attacked by ransomware. Systems were locked down, data couldn't be accessed, certain systems wouldn't run because they couldn't connect to databases in their systems, and the woman had to be transferred to a nearby hospital. Even though that hospital was roughly 30 miles away, she passed away, unfortunately, before she could get there. So all this leads to what's, what's the cause, what are the weaknesses here? And in many cases, as you'll see later in the presentation, these are known as social engineering exploits. So while ransomware is a computer, what's called a worm, generally, a piece of program code that does infect systems, the initial uh, attack point, the initial threat vector is typically something known as phishing attacks. We'll see this later. Lauren will talk about that. And phishing attacks are intended to target basically human error 
We're all vulnerable. We all make mistakes. We're busy. We get caught up in things, and so we make mistakes. And that is the intent of a phishing attack, to target that weakness when you're not paying attention. And maybe click on a link you shouldn't, thereby unleashing uh, the, the malware. Uh, of interest is that while large corporations, the big companies, have come along and starting to tighten their defenses, uh, they've, they do have the resources that many small to medium companies don't have. They have access to larger budgets, they have access to large groups of talent spread across the world, and they have the means and ability to indicate, to, to kick off large projects to implement these controls. Unfortunately, small to mid-sized businesses don't necessarily have that luxury. You're able to put some tools in, some controls, but the scope may not be there, and the sophistication of your defenses may not be as high. Um, and the other, the other side of this that's interesting is as companies get smarter, the larger companies, the bad actors or the cyber, the, the, the criminals out there, they're aware of this. And so just as a criminal uh, burglar might not want to break into a house if the doors are locked and the windows are locked, they'll go to an area where it's not locked. They don't want to be caught. Well, these cyber actors have gotten smart. They know that while the big companies may be locking down, they're going to move down the company size chain and look for those companies that aren't as well defended. So the question is, you know, it's interesting, Mr. Sprague mentioned this, is, is data, electronic data, is a new feedstock for industry. You may not want to be in this electronic world, but to stay competitive, you're going to have to be. I think every company today knows that. You're using some form of information systems and information technology. And the question is, in regard to ransomware, would your business function without your information technology? You might be able to afford that one or two hour glitch because something goes down, but what about ransomware? If we went back to your office today, what would happen if your systems were locked and you had a message saying, oh, pay us in bitcoins this much by a certain time frame, or your data is gone forever? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Lauren. I think this is the right one. Yeah. Now, so as, as this slide indicates, you know, the question is for a lot of organizations, is this going to happen to me? And, and a lot of them, unfortunately, think that they have complete control of their systems or that they're safe or that they're not going to be a target. You know, what do I have that anybody might want? I'm just a small business. I don't have any, anything that anybody else would want from the systems. So when you look at the numbers here, eh, didn't know that was on, but we'll use it. Um, you know, one of the compelling things here is that when, you, when they have a ransomware event, it affects the operations of your business. And typically, an organization might be down from anywhere from a few hours, sometimes a, a matter of days. And, this, this says here, you know, offline for a limited time. Well, what is that time that you can afford to be offline and not be able to, to operate your business? <clears throat> the, uh, the other numbers here, 37% uh, suffer a financial loss and 25% file bankruptcy. So we're seeing uh, more and more organizations that they have a ransomware event uh, maybe they can't pay the ransom in order to try to get their files or recover, or uh, maybe they don't have the backups that they need to be able to restore and recover their business, and they just go, they file for bankruptcy because they can't continue the operation. And then a small percentage, but still a good number, uh, go completely out of business. And we'll see a couple of case studies uh, we have here later that will help illustrate those points as well. And that last point up there on the slide is that uh, while a lot of organizations, you know, think that this isn't going to impact them, that they're, that they're uh, not going to have this type of incident, the reality is that uh, a lot of them are really unprepared for having a ransomware event or a data breach. Uh, so here's some metrics, metrics that uh, matter impacting business. And probably the one here that I'll point out most is this middle one. And most affected clients actually experience three to 14 days of downtime. So just imagine with your business, you know, if you were actually down for three days or four days, five days, whatever that number is, 
Could you continue to do your operations? Could you recover from that? Could you recover not only from the lack of operations, but the impact that it has on your customers and, and potentially losing customers because of inability to deliver your goods or services or because maybe they just don't trust your ability to provide them their services anymore. And Dennis, I think this one is yours. So what are the key contributing factors for a ransomware attack? Most notably, it's related to what's something called cybersecurity hygiene. And basically, it's that simple, well-defined actions like patching known vulnerabilities and so forth, using strong passwords, making sure that you align with a, a known or respected control framework. But it's the whole idea of proactively taking steps. Um, realistically, something as simple as a weak password can, can uh, cause issues with uh, ransomware. Unpatched software is critical. And this is easier said than done. You know, most of you, if you use Microsoft Windows, you know they do a pretty good job of pushing those patches out monthly. But you also know that maybe sometimes those patches might break some of the systems you use, in which case you have to test, in which case now not only are you behind in patching, but the bad actors are well aware of what those patches are supposed to be, and they're always prodding and poking. Uh, social engineering and phishing, this is that behavioral side of cybersecurity. It's a side that ransomware relies on, looking for that weak person, that busy person during the day who gets that email that looks authentic and they're busy, they click it and that's it. That's all that they need. You know, one statistic I like to talk about is you may have 10,000 employees and 9,999 of those employees could be well educated on social engineering and phishing, but it takes one. It only takes one click in your organization to unleash this malware. And that, that's actually a very scary thought. So something called CETA, Security Education Training and Awareness, is very important. And it's something that doesn't have to take a lot of uh, time or resources on your part to implement. Uh, one comment I want to make, too, is uh, it, it's also that idea of looking at your entire organization, not just your information systems today. You also have to look at the use of IoT the Internet of Things, all those little gadgets people are wearing, bringing in your cell phone, Fitbits, everything electronic, everything has today has processes and sensors related. It's important there, but those of you who are manufacturing, if you have operational technology, for many years those were analog systems, but today with the advent of the Internet, that many times you now have new processes coming into those mechanical systems that uh, leverage IT, and so they are also susceptible to cyber attacks as well. So again, uh, metrics that matter, some of the fundamentals, 50%, 57 percent of data breaches are attributed to poor patch management, uh, 74 percent privilege, privilege credential abuse, the whole idea of misusing um, access controls, your identity, who you are, and the author is authentication tools, your password if you're using tokens. And then uh, also, 95% of cloud breaches are due to configuration mistakes. If you are interested in learning more about this, there is a website called www.privacyrights.org, which is free and open to the public. And they provide, they maintain a history of data breaches. And so it's kind of interesting. You can go out and look for companies that you might do business with and see if they've been breached and reported. But you can also use that data to track for yourself what's going on. And in general, the long-term trend for data breaches is up. It's growing, which is interesting. You think that by now with the understanding of controls and defenses, it might be going down. It's not. On an annual basis, it goes up, it goes down. So over time, it goes up and down. But generally, over the long term, it's going up. OK, so the question there, here is, have you ever been fished? Does everybody know when we use the term phishing what that stands for, what it really means? I mean, it's becoming pretty common today uh, to hear the term, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, an overview on that, now, phishing is, is what they call a social engineering technique, and, and basically it's a, it's a scam. It's an attempt to try to uh, fool you into uh, 
clicking on a link or downloading a file attachment or going to a particular website. And in, in the process of doing that, it's trying to collect information, either personal information from you uh, that it can then use. Uh, sometimes it tries to collect user codes and passwords. Sometimes it is, uh, will download malware that will result into a ransomware event like we've been talking. So phishing takes care of uh, poor cyber hygiene and human nature. It takes advantage of both of those. And uh, you know, Dennis talked about the cyber hygiene side. And here's some other statistics for you. That 95% of all attacks are the result of a, of a successful spear phishing. Now spear phishing is when it's targeting a specific individual or targeting a specific industry sometimes. Uh, and, and that, that is just such a huge number when you think about it. If you, if you looked at it from an organizational risk perspective, and you're saying, what can I do mostly to protect my business from, from a, a cyber event, a cyber attack, or, or, or a, you know, a phishing attack, a ransomware attack? Well, this right here should tell you that you should be focusing on those things that help avoid a phishing incident in the first place. I mean, just with that magnitude of number, that would put it high on the risk side of things uh, for you to take care and look at. You have 76% of businesses reported to, to being a victim of phishing attack. Uh, again, a large number. When we look at the number of businesses, especially small and medium businesses in, in the United States, I mean, you're literally talking about millions. Uh, 30% of the messages get opened by targeted users. And then we have another 12% roughly of those users will click on a, a malicious link or download an attachment. Now, we're not talking here about hundreds or thousands. We're talking about millions. When, when you think about it, uh, uh, except for targeted attacks, a, a phishing attack or these email scams in particular, they're, they get sent to millions of email addresses at one time. So even a very, very small percentage of those that somebody clicks on or, or responds to or has to result in them paying money ends up in big numbers. We're talking about a multi-billion dollar business that these people are making off of these, especially the ransomware attacks. Um, so that bottom line on there, if you think your organization is safe from a phishing attack because you haven't yet been targeted, then think again. I think most security experts say it's not a matter of if, it's more a matter of when. And, uh, and that's certainly proven not to be the case. So what I want to share with you now is some examples of, of phishing email that you might receive, and just not email, some of our text messages. This is one that's gotten pretty popular. Almost every year now in the springtime, we hear in that uh, February to March, April time frame of, of organizations or people getting these email from the IRS uh, saying that, you know, making it sound real urgent like you owe them money and you need to act real now, right now. Typical uh, social engineering technique, a sense of urgency and where did we go? A uh, sense of urgency and making you think that, that you have to do something uh, right at the moment. Um, <clears throat> these have gotten to be pretty popular. On IR how, how many have gotten an email from IRS? Have you ever received one of these phishing email? Anybody? Okay, I see a couple of hands going up. I know I have. Uh, IRS does not send email to people. So regardless, uh, if you ever get one, it's not going to be good. Uh, this is one that uh, actually came from Fifth Third Bank, and it was really directing people, giving them information on types of links, and links are in these ads, and if you click on it, then they take you to a site that looks very much like a regular Fifth Third Direct website, uh, but it's a fraudulent site, and it asks you for information, personal information, and it asks for your phone number. You give them the phone number, then they call you, and, and ask for additional information. <clears throat> uh, here, here's one that I particularly like, the security check. So 
is, is your card in the hacker's database? Fill in your card number, fill in your security number. Well, it is now. <laughs> uh, Ohio State University. I, I need, really need to find one of these from, from Michigan, because I'm from Michigan. I should use that as an example. Uh, but here's an email web, web email service uh, saying that you have to act because your email's not working anymore. Uh, click here. I, I got one of these not too long ago that uh, showed up as being from the University of Finlay in my University of Finlay mail. And the thing that was interesting about it is the email address at the top appeared to come from a website in New Zealand. I didn't think that we had a help desk in New Zealand from the university, but um, here's another one. This type of message was going around the uh, last couple of years. It just says, uh, hi, got your number from Zoe. Are you still single? Check out my profile and then a, a link to click on there too. You'll be giving more information than you'll be getting. Uh, here's an example that we actually got at Centricom. And you see this uh, email address up here says netscreen at centricom.net. And it's uh, sending an email saying, hey, you got a voicemail message, so click on this link to listen to the message. This has gotten to be pretty popular, too, for a, for a scam. And of course, if you click on the link, it's not a voicemail message at all, which you'll, uh, you'll find out pretty soon. This was pretty obvious to us only because netscreen, first of all, is not an individual. They shouldn't be getting voicemail. And uh, second of all, we have a different system that t tells us the name of the system that we're getting the voicemail from as well to help validate that. Um, this one here is pretty current. U.S. Small Business Administration scam. A lot of times what you see is that they'll have email addresses or website addresses that look very, very close to the real thing. So if you can see it up here, the actual or the malicious email address is up here. It says disaster customer service at gov-sba.us. And then here, though, is the actual email address to make it look like it's like legitimate. And you click on this, and I like this. It says, find the attached form, complete and submit, and reply. Please ensure all personal, personal and bank details are correct for funding. It's going to be correct for an empty bank account. So I'll turn this back over to Dennis. So in regard to case studies, it's interesting that there are several cases out there. Uh, you don't have to dig very far. If you go to Google and search, you'll find quite a few. But you see here that it does show that there are uh, ransomware is happening at the small to mid-sized business level. It's very frequent. What you may or may not be aware of is also they're targeting cities. In fact, ransomware goes after those who are most likely to pay. In 2018, the city of Atlanta was held ransom well, by, through ransomware. They actually took down all the city functions. So think about that. The city of Atlanta is a pretty big city. They were running the city with telephones, paper, and pencil for months. Um, I think I just read an article. They're still recovering. In 2019, the city of Baltimore was held ransom as well. They went shut down. They went to telephones, paper, and pencil. And the point being, think about your business. Could you run your business this afternoon using a tablet, a pencil, and a telephone? Would you even have know who to call? Would you have your contact list available in analog form as opposed to something in, in a database? And then, of course, just recently, last month, September, Universal Health Services, a hospital with 400 sites across the country, was knocked down by ransomware. They actually came back fairly quickly, meaning it's October, so they came back in a few weeks. But that was mostly due to their uh, incident recovery plan and their business continuity plans. They were prepared for something like this. But the point is that ransomware targets, again, they're looking for those who are forced to pay. Uh, first responders, hospitals, police departments, fire departments, city governments. They're targeting them because they know they're most likely to be held accountable for those actions. They have to recover. So there is recently, the state of Ohio put together Ohio Senate Bill 220 to encourage companies to invest in their cyber defenses, 
pr the primary aspect of this bill is to find a control framework that you're comfortable with. And there are many out there. There are several that you can trust. There are those that I would say get the job done with as little, not as little effort, but as uh, without needing a whole lot of outside help. They're, they're, they're under, understandable and with a good internal IT department, you can get some of these things up and running. And of course, there are frameworks for those companies that are global, the Fortune 500, much more comprehensive, really not suited for a small company. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a framework out there for you. The best news about choosing a framework is you don't have to pick the right one. You just have to pick one. Because what you'll find over time is that even if you got the framework that's not the best for you, you can change. You can move up, move down. The controls are similar. They really differ only in the, uh, in the, in the granularity or the, gr the grade of degree they go into for the level of controls. So survival tactics, what do you do? Well, what you first should do right away is perform a risk assessment. And if you're not familiar with the risk assessment, you should engage a third party. But you're looking for gaps. You're looking for those vulnerabilities across your company, not just in information systems and IT, but again, also that IoT world. And if you're manufacturing, that OT world, operational technology. Um, you want to look for corrective actions. Again, I just mentioned adopt a framework. You need to have that, or you should have that. Uh, and, and keep in mind, frameworks are good ideas because why reinvent the wheel? Yes, you might have a really good cybersecurity department, but these frameworks are vetted out by professionals around the world, and they tend to be a very nice, comprehensive solution of controls that you can implement. Um, develop a roadmap and then execute. If there were two pieces of advice I would leave you with today, number one is before you leave today, contact your IT department and make sure that you understand what your data backup plan is. And then when you go back, confirm that you have a data backup plan and that it works. Data is the feedstock for industry and ransomware counts on you not having that backup. They count on you not being prepared so that you have to pay to get your data back. And what's interesting about this, if you're a small to mid-sized business, you can execute that plan almost immediately. If you've only got a few PCs or a couple servers, you can buy external drives, terabyte drives from Best Buy at a low cost and start backing things up. Windows does a great job of providing a backup tool. The other thing you should do right away is evaluate what is your CETA program, security, education, training, and awareness. What plans do you have for educating your workforce? Again. This doesn't have to be overly complicated. It could be something no more than, hey, did you see this ransomware presentation? I want everybody to watch this. So it's those small steps on making sure that your workforce understands what's going on and is prepared. Because don't forget, there's a technical side of controls, which is where the framework's gonna come in, but there's also a behavioral side of controls, which was what Lauren was talking about as well. And the bad actors are counting for you to not have that behavioral side in place. So, you do these things, you implement a framework, you, you uh, implement procedures, processes, policies, um, and then so, so what do I get out of it from an organization? Well, one, one of the things that you get is risk reduction, uh, minimize opportunities for business disruption, increase your overall business resiliency so you stay in operation, you can make money, um, you increase trust with your business partners and, and your uh, customers that you have, your clients, and increase awareness, uh, training and awareness for all employees. And that's everybody from the, from the owner or president down to you know, whatever levels you have within your organization. Everybody needs to be included in the training program, training process. Uh, additional benefits eliminate customer flight due to cyber risk and ability to obtain and retain contracts. As we, as we saw in one of the case studies, you know, one of the organizations essentially went bankrupt because they couldn't recover the data that they had in their systems and they couldn't sustain the amount of money they were having to pay out lawsuits from, from, from the customers that were, uh, you know, whose information, private information was revealed due to the data breach. Uh, avoiding regulation, reg, uh, regulatory s sanctions. If you're in the type of business where you have regulatory requirements, compliance requirements, 
the, F, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, Security Exchange Commission, have gotten pretty aggressive in uh, fining and finding sanctions against organizations. Um, we already mentioned downtime and business disruption, and then the ability to, to maybe sleep a little better at night. So these are the high-value controls, and, and it was interesting because many of these things you've heard Dennis mentioned, you heard uh, Robert Sprague mention, uh, keeping your systems up to date, training and awareness programs, uh, patching your systems is essential. That is, that is one of the biggest things you can do is keep your, your applications up to date, that you're, especially those that are exposed to the internet, but even the ones that are internal because if you click on a bad link or, or download a bad attachment, they're inside your network at that point. Uh, user access management means uh, everybody shouldn't be a privileged user. Everybody shouldn't have administrative access. You need to have controls around that. Multi-factor authentication is another major uh, safety net that you can implement and control access to your systems. Uh, backup and restore operations, as Dennis mentioned, and then uh, incident management in terms of having an incident management plan, incident response plan, and uh, you know Robert Sprague brought that uh, that up as well. Um, this might be a little bit hard to read, and I, I know it wasn't in a uh, you know black font, which made it a little more difficult. But I wanted to bring this up because our next speaker, uh, Jeff Gilmore, is going to be talking about cyber insurance. And uh, this was uh, an attorney that uh, was speaking at a, at a conference, and, and this was the comments that he made. And thus discussing why insurance is so crucial and the possible devastation from cyber attack. I just want to go down here to this very last comment that was made. It might seem a little dramatic, but I think it's becoming more and more true. So, but it's the one risk that I know of right now, other than maybe nuclear war, where in one night, everything can change and completely impact your operations. And, and that's the truth. Um, you don't want to be that, that, that individual or that business owner who gets a call at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning saying, uh, Sir, I have some news, and it's not good. So with that, uh, thank you for your time in today. I would appreciate your attendance, and I hope you got some value out of our presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we'd be glad to try to answer them, or, or maybe we're running a little short on time. We can answer them after the next speaker. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much to our two wonderful speakers. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to remind people to please keep your masks on when you're not eating, especially when you're relatively close together at the tables. Uh, up next, we have Jeff Gilmore from Highland. Uh, Jeff has nearly 20 years of property and casualty insurance experience working with manufacturing, chemical, government, real estate, and construction clients. He serves as a technical advisor at Highland and frequently performs coverage audits of insurance programs to identify technical coverage deficiencies. Jeff has worked extensively in the areas of multi-state worker compensation, group captive programs, and has helped clients place insurance coverage in more than a dozen different countries around the world. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Health from Bowling Green State University and currently holds the professional designations of Certified Insurance Counselor, Certified Risk Manager, and Construction Risk Insurance Specialist. In addition, Jeff served for 12 years in the Ohio Army National Guard, achieving the rank of Captain, and was awarded the Bronze Star and the Combat Action Badge for his service. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Gilmore. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about uh, cyber insurance and what's going on in the uh, crazy world of ransomware and 
how we're getting these claims paid for that we talked a lot about. So we're going to talk about uh, the insurance proceeds that uh, um, are coming into to play with some of these things and how they're getting mixed up in the crossfire of everything that's going on. Uh, we'll talk about some of the changes that's driving in the insurance world as they respond to paying some of these large claims and then give you some ideas about what it looks like, uh, what the insurance limits and costs look like, and then give you some live examples. Um, so the first thing is, if you ever see one of these in your business, uh, this is going to be a bad day um, in the office. Uh, this was an actual ransomware um, note that was received uh, recently uh, with a $23 million ransom demand. So this was a large uh, foreign company, um, but it, it's hitting even the largest, most sophisticated companies in the world, and then we are seeing it here um, in our neck of the woods as well. So it's, it's hitting everybody equally uh, across the board. So Target could be a business owner. Uh, this is also happening to some of our small government entities. Um, they are the Target. Cyber criminals are coming after them uh, because they've learned how to exploit and get cash out of them, um, which allows uh, an opportunity for IT professionals to help secure the back door. And then on top of that, uh, we have cyber insurance. Business owners are, uh, cannot afford to take on that much risk daily, so they're using cyber insurance to cover a lot of that. So the way this is starting to escalate now because it's insurance proceeds, some of my cybersecurity professionals have accused us of pouring gasoline onto the fire because we now have policies available that are paying one, two to five million dollars uh, for certain events. Um, and some, some fellow cybersecurity professionals are, I believe that is escalating, uh, which is driving more cyber attacks. So this is all kind of ramping up. And then the latest thing that uh, we're reading now is more of uh, the Department of Treasury OFAC restrictions on ransomware payments. Um, they are starting to scrutinize that heavily and we believe there's going to be some things coming down the pike uh, in the future with that. They believe those payments are going to bad actors and they certainly those violate OFAC controls. So that's something that's going to be taking place more and more. Um, especially, you know, organizations like Wasted Locker, Evil Corp, they're affiliated with uh, foreign government actors. Uh, they do not want proceeds going to those folks. Um, so I think there's going to be additional scrutiny on ransom payments. So that's kind of the story of what's happening in the crossfire. A lot of our business clients are right in the middle of this. They want to run their, their company. They want to be profitable. Um, the insurance companies that I represent want to have claims less than premiums, so they're, they're in profit. Um, IT security professionals want to make sure things are shut down and their clients are secured and the, the hackers are out there trying to get money. So it's a little bit of a wild west and uh, the, the monetary numbers of acting or not acting are getting to be quite staggering. Um, a couple of examples of not acting that I was able to find um, mentioned before in an early presentation, City of Atlanta did not act and it cost them 17 million to fix what could have been paid off in a ransom uh, for much, much less. Same thing with City of Baltimore. So the, the not acting can be just as expensive if your security isn't in place and, and you do become vulnerable here. Um, these are just the public examples. I will tell you that three weeks ago, there's a company here in town that was also hacked and ransomed for 2.2 million. They negotiated it down to 1.9 million and they ultimately did not pay. So you're not hearing a lot of detailed examples from your neighbors and fellow companies in, in the business park because it's something that's not talked about. Uh, the professionals that help, help handle these issues are under NDAs and they don't want this information out because it's detrimental to their, their reputation and their customer base. So it's not something you're gonna hear a lot about. It is happening a lot more than, than what we realize. Um, it, it's very, very prevalent. Um, so what's happened in the cyber marketplace? Ransomware is the number one threat. We've talked about that. There are some other things that are going on, but ransomware has really escalated in, in recent months. Um, their email phishing, again, is the way they're getting in. Um, and it's the most common issue we're dealing with right now. Used to be where they used to hack in and try to get some of your sensitive data and then exploit that. Um, and yet some liability evolved with failing to protect that information. That's gone by the wayside. The clients that we're dealing with right now are, are all uh, mostly dealing with ransomware. The other piece of this um, that's coming up in addition to ransomware, they've started to exfiltrate some data so that if you have robust backup systems, um, 
and you can restore and continue your operations without interruption or minimal interruption, they are starting to exfiltrate data so that they can blackmail you for that data being released. So that's the next escalation that we're starting to see. Even when companies are very robust, can secure themselves, can continue operations, uh, they're starting to blackmail for the sensitive data they do get out of your systems. Um, cost of ransomware is going up over time. It's really started to escalate really in the last 12 months. Um, million dollar demands on ransomware are very, very common. Uh, we do see those across the board. And some of the IT security professionals that we watch and, and read the reports, they're tracking ransom demand by type of virus that they're able to launch in there. And they can tell you which strains are more costly than others. So the, um, it, it's definitely going up in cost. Um, and as they're more and more successful, uh, they're just going to continue to attack more and more. Cyber insurance has been around for 20 some years. Uh, it really started out of a crime type of theory and then evolved uh, to what today is a very robust, uh, very sophisticated coverage platform uh, specifically for cyber threats. Um, it is covered, you know, essential coverage. I would say 80 plus percent of our clients that we work with are buying cyber insurance because the threat is that prevalent. Um, premiums were way too low for the threat back in the day, and now they're escalating uh, quite rapidly. We are seeing renewal increases around 20, 25 percent as a norm, um, just because the claim payments uh, have accelerated quite a bit. Um, insurers are also starting to cut back as some of these large payments get, get paid out. Insurers are starting to cut their capacity down to where they, they used to offer a $5 million policy to one of our clients and they really didn't think much of it. Now they're cutting that back and maybe they'll only offer $1 million or $2.5 million of limits and we have to go get a second insurance company to participate in the program to fully protect our client. So the capacity is, is dropping and the rate is going up. Um, but what we haven't seen is restrictions on ransomware terminology or coverage. It is still fully covered by all of our major insurers. Um, and we are seeing a couple of other issues evolve, things that we really didn't think of. There was a court case last month out of Colorado related to ERISA liability. So the uh, 401k plan uh, had a, a theft. It was a hacking event. They got in. They stole about $132,000 from a plan participant. And then the responsibility was kind of a finger pointing. Is that the plan sponsor because they failed to secure the, the plan assets? Or was that the, the actual retirement com you know, management company that was managing the assets, doing the online portfolio and password protocols and all those things? Who was responsible for a ERISA protected plan having a theft of funds by cyber attack? So that's a little bit of a gap in insurance coverage and it's gonna be evolving trend as we go forward as is uh, cyber physical claims. Cyber um, policies, we'll look here in a minute, cover you know, the typical hacking, data restoration, fixing the computers. They do not have coverage for bodily injury or property damage, as alluded to in the, in the prior example. H hospital had a patient die because of a, a hacking event. That's typically, that's not something you get in a standard policy, and it's something you have to look at in your risk assessment of your company if that's something to be concerned about and negotiate specific coverage for it. So we're starting to see a lot more uh, consideration of that, especially as production machinery becomes automated um, under computer control, if that's hacked and someone's injured or you know, goes out, uh, off and damages someone else's property, um, that currently can be a coverage gap between a, uh, two different policies in a commercial portfolio. Something to think about. Um, we are also starting to see um, a couple of things. This is another example where hacking can get into production machinery. This was just a, a news article that came across the other day. A uh, specific strain of malware that can get in and exploit production machinery. You then have a property damage resulting uh, from a hacking event. So these are different things to consider as we keep going down the path of cyber escalation, different you know, second and, and th third tier effects uh, that need to be taken into consideration. Typical insurance policy structure, over the last 20 years, this has evolved, coverage has grown to, to meet different demands and subject to today, you can see in red, extortion payments 
are one of the things that are paid by a cyber insurance policy. Um, and as that evolves, there are professionals that will help deal with that, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But the policy is really set up to deal with liability for failing to protect the data in your systems, whether that be customer information, your employees' information. Um, it's meant to deal with the IT professionals, the public relations firms, consultants, um, all those types of things to secure your system, your environment. One of the bigger things we'll talk about in a minute, I'll give you some examples. We're seeing a, a big uh, area of claims is business interruption. Typical shutdown is three to 14 days, um, and that can result in a lot of lost business, lost customers, lost revenue. So that's another big component of a cyber insurance program. So a couple of other things here. Um, the number one currency used to pay ransom is Bitcoin. 99% um, of claims are paid in Bitcoin. We're starting to see some uh, evolution towards Monero, which I'm, I'm not a computer guy, I don't know what that is. Um, so we're starting to see use of different coin, but it's an anonymous type of, bit, of uh, cryptocurrency, uh, which is why they use it. Um, in studies that I've seen, average downtime is about 15 days. Um, and then when you actually do pay the ransom, 99% of the time you're going to get the decrypt tool and 96% of the time the tool is going to work. We've only seen one or two scenarios where the decrypt tool didn't work and the IT professionals were able to contact them back, get a, a different tool and actually unlock the data. It took two tries, but uh, um, they're very professional organizations. They have very good customer service. They want to make sure you're satisfied with your decryption. Um, we're even seeing some of these um, organizations set up call centers um, very, very professional level uh, hacking firms, and they're set up to just make this an easy process for you to pay and get your data back. So just to give an example, what does uh, cyber insurance cost? Um, the, the floor is uh, about a million dollar policy. That's usually the minimum limits that we're seeing clients buy. That's just to get in the game. This is an example, $180 million revenue manufacturing company here in Northwest Ohio, paid about $12,000 a year of premium for a $1 million policy. That's gonna have deductibles in it, it's gonna have some safeguards to it. Um, and then you can see as you buy up that second and third million of limit, it becomes cheaper per million of layer um, as you go up. But that's where we see most clients jumping into the game is buying at least a million dollars. It gives them access to the service providers, gives them a, a funding source for ransom and negotiators and all the professionals that come in, um, and it's a starting point. Um, there is no universal limit or rule of thumb of what limit is appropriate to buy for a business. Everybody has to do their own risk evaluation and then select a limit that they're comfortable with for their own protection. It's uh, usually different for everybody. A couple of things, um, and I've even seen this this week, the cyber insurance marketplace is changing. There is a lot of scrutiny on controls. We used to quote cyber insurance, offer it to the client, get their acceptance to purchase the coverage, and then, okay, go ahead and fill out the application, sign that, send it in, and, and we'll get the coverage bound. That's the way it used to work. It is not working that way anymore. The application must be completed entirely. Uh, you must go through a second round of questions. I even had an offer this week where we completed the application, answered the second round of questions, and then we were trying to debate whether we should buy a million dollars of liability coverage or two million. And the underwriter came back and says, okay, well, if you do multi-factor authentication, we'll be willing to offer two million in coverage. If you don't put F MFA in place, you can only buy one. We won't even sell you the second million of coverage because you're that much at risk. So put it in place if you want the second million, and it's a, we're working with that client now to get that in place over time, increase the one million to two million. But that's the way the scrutiny has come down from the underwriters. This coverage and claims is so hot right now, they won't even offer limits at any price if you don't have the right protocols in place. So there's a lot of discussions going on there. We've also had one client, uh, we were negotiating the um, cyber insurance renewal, unbeknownst to us, the insurance company had an open port scan done of our client, came back to us, and identified the open ports that they found, 
and said, we're done with the renewal underwriting until you get the ports closed. So that's becoming a technique as well of insurers. They're not willing to risk their millions of dollars if you're not willing to, to secure your systems. So that has been a, a recent change as well. Um, and it's something where I'm not an IT guy, but I'm, I learned what an open port scan was real quick. Um, so we're helping clients get, get their IT teams to, to address those things. Biggest thing in insurance company policy when you have an event uh, is the insurance company response. They have a network of providers that are specifically trained and, and well experienced in dealing with these types of events. Um, unfortunately, it's becoming more common. They're getting lots of experience. Biggest thing is notify the insurance company immediately. Don't wait a week till you figure out what happened and what was going on uh, to notify the insurer. A lot of the policy language requires as soon as practicable notice, if not immediate notice within 24 hours. So you really have to watch the notification. The insurance company wants their folks in to help deal with the event, to manage it and minimize liability. They want to make sure they're on board right away. Um, we are seeing uh, an evolution of cyber insurers get away from phone and email notification because if you've been breached, you're probably not going to email anything. You probably don't have access to anything. So now we're seeing the evolution where these, these truly dedicated cyber insurers have their own app that's loaded on the CFO's phone or the IT professional's phone so that on a Friday at 6.30 at night when the hack gets launched, uh, they can go to that app. It has access to all the service providers and you can truly deal with the event offsite disconnected from your systems that are locked out. Uh, coordination of legal response, again, legal, IT forensic, ransom negotiators. There are folks out there, this is their specific line of work. They ransom, they negotiate ransoms, and then they figure out how to transact that. Um, I mentioned before, uh, uh, OFAC uh, countries are restricted, Department of Treasury's putting some scrutiny on this. I think they're probably gonna go to the point where uh, ransom negotiation, ransom payments are only gonna be done by authorized and licensed companies. Uh, seems to be like, a, a, I've read that a, a number of times. I think they're gonna go to a licensing type thing where only specific companies that are trained to deal with this can pay those ransoms on your behalf. So th that's common um, if they don't outright prohibit it in the future. Um, there's also data restoration companies out there. And then one of the things that we don't talk a lot about in, in these types of forms, but is important to consider if you're a business owner, um, DNO, employment practices, kidnap and ransom, or other crime coverages that may be available in your portfolio. Some of those policies may be able to trigger as well. Uh, we have seen trigger of kidnap and ransom uh, coverages and some ancillary benefits there to go along with cyber. It certainly is no substitute for cyber, a true cyber policy, but there could be some other benefits there. So work with your insurance professional to, to make sure you're looking at all avenues. A uh, couple of examples. This is a, a $28 million revenue cabinet manufacturer. Uh, they were hacked. Um, weak admin passwords, we heard that a couple of times. Make sure you segregate duties and have good passwords. Um, they encrypted for three bitcoins. Restoration failed. I can't tell you how many times I hear that in claim scenarios. Yeah, 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 we got backups, we got backups, we have backups. And then when they go to actually use them, they don't work. That is not very helpful. So um, four days, no access to systems, completely down and out. So this is one, an example of a client that had $130,000 of business interruption loss. They did pay $38,000 in ransom and then had to deal with some forensic uh, IT costs to help them deal with that event. Had they had the backups that worked, they probably could have got away with far less and had much less interruption. Another example, medical service provider. This is an example where they were breached. This is a larger company, they were breached. Um, the IT vendor came in and re-imaged hardware. They were able to, to restore their functioning pretty quickly. Um, however, they're in the world of HIPAA. They have uh, very sensitive data, um, and they weren't really sure if they needed to provide notice or not. Working with their IT professionals, they were actually able to go through and identify the, the virus strain that affected their computers and figure out all the, all the issues with it and, and pull on past experience and they were able to determine with a high probability there was, there was not access to confidential information or, or PHI. So in that case, they were able to work with just remediation cost and restoration cost 
and they did not have to go through $200,000 worth of, of patient notification costs. So that's where an example where having the right uh, breach advisors in, in place with your insurer can definitely help minimize cost. Um, and then last example, uh, tech service provider, you know, again, this is a, a tech world. They hosted platforms for, for of all things, insurance brokers. Um, they had 100, uh, 150 servers. They were in the data center. They're in, in the cloud. So just because you're operating in a cloud environment, your data is out there, does not mean you're immune. You're still in, in, uh, involved. Uh, 75 bitcoins negotiated down to 25 bitcoin. Um, they were able to go through and restore everything, but this one, once they got in and restored, got back in operation, they discovered there was a second ransomware attack that was laying in wait, just hadn't launched yet. So they were double infected, uh, new servers, data restored, they ended up paying a ransom, they had a whole bunch of service. Now here's the one thing is, 14% of their customers that use this, this service provider, 14% of customers cut the contract and walked. If, because they're not secure. Reputationally, that's very, very detrimental, and they lost uh, $230,000 of, of lost business just in the first 12 months. The cyber policy only pays 12 months of indemnity, so they lost $230,000 of, of lost business in 12 months just because their customers weren't gonna deal with this. It was an unsatisfactory provider. So reputationally, that's a big, big problem, and then all the cost to, to get it back up and running, um, that's a big problem as well. So lots of second and third tier effects coming out of these things. And there's some big, big numbers behind them. So that's the real quick down and dirty version of insurance on everything that you've heard about here today. Questions, concerns? At, at this juncture, we'll take questions from for Lauren or Dennis or Jeff. We are running a few minutes late, so if you do have to depart, we understand. But if there, are there any questions to the three individuals that did speak? If not, I would like to, to make one comment and kind of bring this full circle. You heard Jeff just share insurance and how important controls are in place. You heard from Dennis and from Lauren about cybersecurity frameworks. Those frameworks help create an understanding of those kinds of controls that need to be put in place. Treasurer Spray talked about what they do at their office, implementing some of these controls. So the whole theme today went full circle. All three of the individuals, four of the individuals that spoke, are helping us understand what we need to do. It's not one simple thing. It's not just insurance. It's just not cybersecurity framework. It's not just um, and, and user security training. It takes all of these things in order to make sure that we're secure. So I just wanted to make sure that we kind of had a summation of how all this works together and how important it is. And we really are grateful that all of you are here learning about this because you can take this back to your organizations. You can also then be ambassadors to others who don't understand some of these things that are happening. Are there any questions? microphone for anybody that wants to ask a question. Charity? Um, question if you've seen more cloud um, breaches in the last year. We have a lot of vendors that offer services and that has been the big push is to go to the cloud, but I'm now reading more about cloud breaches. I've only seen a couple of cloud breaches where my clients have been um, pulled into those types of situations. Um, I also look at a lot of contracts when my clients are hiring cloud service providers. Um, and the thing that's most concerning with those contracts is they're going to limit the cloud's liability to two months worth of, of service fees paid. They are absolutely in a no way, shape, form liable for anything that goes wrong. And if they are liable, it's capped at two times monthly invoices. Um, so that's where we still step in. Even if it's out, that is in the cloud for my clients, we still provide a full limit of cyber liability insurance because the cloud is, it's good, but from a liability standpoint and a cost and a risk standpoint, there's, there's not much uh, shifting of risk over there. Yeah, just so one thing I wanted to add to that is that an awful lot of organizations when they they put their 
infrastructure or their data in the cloud, they, they think that that automatically is protecting them. The organization is still responsible for the protection and privacy of the data that they are in control of, whether it's on their premises or whether it's in the cloud. They're still responsible for the controls to be in place to protect that confidential or privileged data, whatever it may be. Um, and that's where some of the disconnect comes sometimes. There's an assumption that's made that uh, probably says in the contract pretty clearly somewhere that uh, the, the cloud providers are not the responsible authority the, the person buying the services is or the business buying the services. Other questions? If not, I have, I have one additional one. With the COVID and the situation that occurred to all of us last March, did you see any changes in cyber insurance due to the fact that so many people now are working remotely and will continue to work remotely? Has that changed insurance? I think that's driven up the frequency of events because everybody's working remote and controls aren't as, as vigorously enforced when everybody's dispersed from a workforce standpoint. Um, so I, looking at the numbers that I can see now, tracking 2019 into 2020, frequency is up um, just because of, of protocols. Um, and then I think it's just, uh, severity is also up, um, but I don't know if, what the cause of that is. I don't think that's tied to anything coronavirus related. I think that's just tied to the fact they figured out they could get more, and so it's kind of an escalating. And I would think that would increase rates then. If there's more, would that not increase insurance rates to be able to cover it? If there's more frequency, yes, that is gonna drive up insurance rates uh, across the board. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Anyone at all? John, as we're finishing up today, did you have any particular comments you wanted to make from Highland? Okay. Helen, anything else from the university? Otherwise, I turn it back over to Paul, is that correct? Paul, are you taking us home for the rest of the Or do we just close it out? I think we have a few thank yous and sponsors to thank and that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate this. Paul's going to finish up. All right, first things first, I think we should hand out our information assurance certificates. If Dr. Schneider would come up and help me with those real quick. Thank you, speakers. Helen is distributing a gift to each of you, and we thank you very much for speaking today. I believe we're going into the next session that has to do with the 1 to 2 o'clock time frame. Yes. So those folks that are business folks that want to stay are welcome to, but they don't necessarily need to stay. We're going to be talking about, we are going to be talking about internships and job seeking and onboarding in COVID times because we have found that it's had an impact on our students and so we thought that we normally do some discussion. I know some folks are interested in hiring and looking for students and so I have some students who are seeking so this is also a nice time to, uh, to make some of those connections as well. So we do welcome you to stay if you would like to stay for that session. Um, first we are going to be awarding certificates to our information assurance um, graduates, the ones who completed all of our information assurance coursework. So if you're looking for people with that kind of background, um, the next five individuals that we'll talk about are going to, uh, going to be students that you might want to talk to. And you want to tell them about next year? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Real quickly, mark your calendars for next year. It'll be our 20th Information Assurance Forum.
Uh, hopefully we'll continue on with this format. If not, we'll go back to the format we used to have. It is on October 27th, which is the last Wednesday of October. And we always welcome comments, feedback, anything from anyone here about the topic. We try to make it as relevant as possible for that time. So if you have ideas for other topics that we should uh, pursue, please do let us know. Otherwise, um, you're welcome to stay, as Helen just said. Uh, we are going to go into the next session, and we'll have panel discussions and invite the students to ask questions. Uh, for those of you that do need to get back to business, we truly understand that. And thank you for attending, and again, thank you for all of our speakers. We're deeply grateful for, for you being here today and, and presenting. We all, I believe, learned quite a bit. I see a lot of no nodding heads here. All right, Helen, anything else? Evaluation? All right. Thank you, everyone. And any students who attended, please remember to grab your attendance vouchers before you leave. I think I'm short enough. All right. We're going to recognize our students who are getting their information assurance certificates at this point. So first, I'd like to call Salwa Ahajabed to this stage, please. Salwa was very involved while she was here at the university. Um, as you can see, she's a, a graduate student at the University of Cincinnati now in their cybersecurity track. And um, you're going to get to hear a little bit from her. She has a video that we're going to play in a minute here. Um, so Sawa has, um, she had computer science major with um, business and information assurance emphases. And she also had minors in information processing, business information assurance, and business administration and psychology as well. So Salwa kept herself very busy while she was here. Most enthusiastic in the classroom. Um, she was also a softball player, very, very involved. And um, when she finished with softball, she put all of that energy into extra activities and projects. And I, I really enjoyed having her in class. So Salwa is going to be one of our first ones to talk to about her experience with internships in the COVID time. So I'll invite Salwa to come on over here to the, to the panel uh, table, because we're going to have you sit in one of those seats. All right, next up, um, if you would, what? I've got a clicker here, let's see. Oh yeah, there we go, Ryan. Ryan Hellman, would you please come on up? So Ryan Hellman um, was also one of our spring graduates, uh, so graduating in the time of COVID. He is actually a graduate student here at the University of Finley right now in our MBA program, and he's managing the men's basketball team. Um, he was very busy while he was here as well at uh, the university. And he completed several internships as well as working with the basketball team while he was here as an undergraduate student as well. Um, so welcome to Ryan. And you're going to join us on our panel as well, right? Because that graduate school doesn't think, thing doesn't last forever either. All right. Next up, um, if we go to the next slide. Oh, I might not be on. That makes a difference, doesn't it? There we go. Thank you. 
Adam Lee was not able to join us this afternoon, and um, that's unfortunate because I think Adam is one of our students still looking for a position. Um, Adam was a spring graduate in information assurance as well, um, and he had an interesting story to tell about his time because he was in an internship in the spring, worked tremendously hard helping get people ready for um, going to work from home and remotely, but then um, his internship had a strange twist. So um, I will share some, some insights from Adam's experience um, during the panel, but he um, was supposed to get more projects to work on, and there was just nobody had the bandwidth to work with him to give him the projects when he went, once he went remote. So um, that was kind of a, an interrupted internship. Um, but we'll be getting Adam his certificate. We'll be sending it on to him. And our next one is Grant Ricketts. And Grant was hoping to join us by Zoom, and unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, will not be able to join us. He is now working for Cardinal Health, and he has the uh, very impressive title of Senior Analyst IT Audit SOX Compliance. And so um, he was a very hard worker. He helped make our connections with the Ohio Cyber Range so that we could run some Capture the Flag events in the spring and helped um, facilitate one for the local cyber securing exploring post as well. Um, so very, very um, enthusiastic young man, very capable and talented and had hoped to participate in the panel as well. Um, but unfortunately, he will not be able to join us that way by Zoom today. Um, but we will also be sending his certificate to him in Dublin. And then finally, last but not least, we have Tucker Stocker. And Tucker is with us, so come on up, Tucker. Tucker was on the swim team while he was here. Tucker is, um, is currently working at Lowe's on a third shift, he said, so I really appreciate his taking the time to come. Um, but he is also seeking um, a position more in line with his cybersecurity training, so he's going to join us as well up here. Fine. See, I knew we could do that. All right. So we have some panelists here. All right. You want to go ahead and sit down? So they all have a certificate, and um, the certificate means that they completed a series of six courses that are focused on um, cybersecurity training. Now, we have an alum from our program, and Brian Flores is going to come and join us. So come on up. Brian graduated a few years ago. 2000. 2016, okay, a few years, four years ago, not too bad. Um, and he is going to come and join us because he's actually seeking students at this point in time. Um, but he can maybe talk about what's different in this COVID era with job hunting as well. So if you want to take a seat for our panel, um, we're going to start off then. Um, so let's have a round of applause for our students that earned their certificates. both recently and a little bit longer ago. And um, I think now we can switch to the, um, to the video that we have, if you would, please. And I'm going to say a plug for Dick Dukes in the, uh, in the booth, because he has been quite helpful. And, and AJ and his team down below, we appreciate all the technology help that we have at this point. All right. And this is Salo's experience with, um, with internships and, and figuring out what was next after graduation. She pre-recorded it for us. She was, she was smart. She said, I wanted to get everything right. So she got all of her points in there. All right. All right. I'll turn it over. Hi, everyone. My name is Salwa, and I graduated from UF this past May. I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences with COVID and the impact it had on my internship, job searching, and onboarding experiences. So back in January, I interviewed with the Cleveland Clinic for an IT internship position. I really wanted a technical internship before I graduated because I thought it would be a great way to wrap up my undergraduate career. In the midst of waiting to hear back from them, I actually applied to grad school at the University of Cincinnati for the next school year, just so that I had a chance to pursue that opportunity if that's what I decided in the months to come. So I was introduced to UC's program from last year's IA Forum because of my research on state initiatives and because Professor Michael spoke on behalf of the education branch of the Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee. So about three weeks after I interviewed with the Cleveland Clinic, I was offered the position and very excitingly accepted it right away. So fast forward a month or so, I got back to Finley from spring break and a few days later, in-person classes were canceled because of the coronavirus. So with being a computer science student, 
I thought that the, that the transition to online was a little bit smoother than it was for others, but my professors also did a really good job getting everything up and running in like four days, which was really awesome. Uh, moving online didn't really affect my life too much right away. I was grateful that I had finished softball the year before, and while I did miss seeing my peers and my family and my professors, a lot of opportunities and experiences were moved online. Commencement wasn't going to happen in May, which was a little bit of a bummer, but we did have a virtual commencement and the actual ceremony did get rescheduled. So I was also really grateful for that. So come April, I started to see that internships on LinkedIn were getting canceled and some industry professionals were losing their jobs. I was a little nervous because I had not heard anything from the Cleveland Clinic but I remember thinking that since they were in healthcare, maybe they needed that extra help because I know at the time Cuyahoga County was not doing very well. Then at the end of April, which was a couple of weeks before my onboarding appointment, I got a call from the HR contact and they had decided to push back the internship. So instead of onboarding in May and starting in June, I was going to onboard in June and start in July with the internship being a few weeks shorter than originally planned, which was okay with me because I was just really thankful that I was still gonna have the opportunity to learn from them. Then the three days before my onboarding appointment in June, I received the call that the internship was canceled. They wanted to keep their current employees safe as well as their future employees, and they just didn't know how they could transition the internship online while giving us the full Cleveland Clinic experience. So I was obviously a little disappointed that it got canceled because I knew that I was going to learn a lot from them and there was that potential to pursue the position full time upon completion, but I understood. So at the time, there were very few internships out there, if any, and the job market wasn't looking very good. I had learned on LinkedIn that companies had job postings but weren't actively looking or were just kind of letting the applications pile up until times were good for them. So as a person who just graduated, this was pretty intimidating. So all I knew was that whatever I chose to pursue, I wanted to give it my all. I didn't want days to go by and not make any progress in my professional career, so I thought that grad school would be a great option with everything going on. Finley gave me that great base knowledge and UC was going to take it to the next level with their hands-on cyber experiences. The master's degree also requires an internship, so I was definitely going to get that opportunity for a technical internship before pursuing a full-time job in the real world. And that is what I ended up doing, and I am extremely glad that I did. I'm learning a lot in the realm of cyber, and it will help better qualify me for future jobs. I'm also currently applying to internships for the summer of 2021. There are so many internships posted right now. My go-to sources are Indeed and LinkedIn. They are really powerful tools. I do like LinkedIn a little bit better because it specializes in networking, news, and job searching. Well, that was a quick summary of my experiences. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. So I think Salva did a really nice job of sort of summarizing what many of our students faced in the spring with things changing and shifting. And as I mentioned with Adam, he was in an internship, he was providing a lot of IT support and was very, very busy right before they all went home. But then once they went home and they sent Adam home, they had a hard time giving him work to do remotely. And so he ended up um, not finishing the things that he had thought he would. He had enough completed on his internship that he was fine with his credits and he still graduated on time. But um, it, was a, it was kind of a, a definite shift in the expectations. Um, I'm going to also have Matthew come on over and join the group at the panel there. Um, Matthew is, um, he's, he's a graduate student here at the university in our Master's of Security and um, 
security, applied security and analytics. I should know that, I teach in that program. Um, but he is um, one of our master's degree students and he's also um, a graduate assistant, a teaching assistant, and he works for me, um, actually working with assessment work right now and, and I depend on him and the other graduate assistant very much, so, so I'm, I'm very grateful to have him here. Um, but he was looking for a technical internship during the summer and so ran into some of the same experiences. So I guess I would like to um, give each of you a chance to talk. We've, we've kind of heard from Sawa um, if, if she uh, wants to add something, but then we'll go on and maybe, maybe Ryan, do you have some things you'd like to say about what's happened in your experience? So if you would take a minute and tell us about your experience. Well, my experience was similar to like Sawa's. I, before this whole pandemic kind of hit, I was kind of thinking about going back for a map for a MBA just because I figured eventually it would probably be shut down. I was thinking this back in February right before every, everything did shut down. So I was kind of preparing to go back for an MBA. So as I as soon as I saw everything shut down, I'm like I'm gonna go back for an MBA because I don't know when the job market is gonna open up for uh, full-time jobs for the summer since we didn't know anything was gonna happen. So I was also trying to get internships, but most of them were hard to come by. And if they were remote, I know applying on Indeed, I saw over a thousand, two thousand applicants with, with me also applying that it was going to be almost a long shot trying to get since everyone was trying to get some work done. So that's what I experienced. Thank you. Tucker. Um, so whenever the shutdown started to happen, I had yet to start my job search for when I graduated, which was a mistake because as soon as everything started shut down, there was pretty much next to no opportunities. And then around the middle of summer, I started to like search again because there started to be more jobs available. And so far, I've been just using Indeed and most of the jobs that I apply for, I don't know if they're like outdated and old, but I never hear back, like declined or otherwise. Um, so currently I've just got a job so I could save some fun for whenever I would go to get a computer science job because ideally I would like to move out of Finley and that's going to require so I'm working right now really. Thank you. All right. We're going to skip over you a minute, Brian. We're going to go to Matthew. Matthew, tell us about your search for technical internships over the summer. And you can take your mask down while you're talking. I meant to tell you all that, sorry. Uh, my experience has been pretty similar to the other ones that we've talked about. Um, I was in the process of looking for an internship. I only had one internship as part of my undergrad experience, so I was hoping to get another one just to give me more experience before I go out and look for a full-time position. Um, and that was not too long before everything with COVID kicked off. So I, I had some declines that I received and then I was in talks with some, uh, two different companies about internships with them, but they both suspended in, uh, internships in light of COVID just because they were going to be dealing with their own situations, getting people working remotely, getting, dealing with clients, uh, helping them in some cases. So it, potential opportunities fell through just because of the current global situation. Um, I did have one potential job opportunity during all of this um, with the Board of Elections for Ohio that was uh, facilitated by Matt Curtin. Interhack. Um, I was not one of the final select, uh, final participants for the team, I guess, that he was putting together to work that position. Um, though that was, uh, the selections were all made by the state of Ohio. So he was just mostly putting together a list of suggestions and passing them on. Um, but other than that, my experience hasn't been too different from from the others. 
And you were already in graduate school, so. Yes, I was already in graduate there, at, at that point, and I was already working with Dr. Snyder at that point. There you go. All right, so Brian, have you got good news for us? I hear you're hiring. <laughs> yeah. Recruiting. Yeah, so uh, we've all experienced the change that uh, this pandemic has brought on, um, but it's not all bad. Um, you know, I, I frequently see the, uh, the meme on LinkedIn where, you know, it's like, who, uh, who's responsible for shifting to a remote work? You know, is it uh, the CEO, the, C the CISO? No, Corona. Um, you know, so it, it is, there is some good news coming out of this. Uh, companies are realizing that it's not so dangerous to work remote. It, it does it definitely expand the threat landscape, but if you do it responsibly and if you do it securely, uh, employees are uh, just as productive, if not more productive, in a remote setting. Uh, I was fortunate, uh, I was already working full-time remote uh, when this uh, pandemic kicked off, but uh, it's, it's a good thing, uh, you know, that the, so many more companies uh, you know, hearing about uh, folks that are looking for jobs and looking outside of Finley. Um, you can do that, you not even have to move away from Finley anymore. Um, I've worked for a few different companies that are not in Finley, uh, just by the sheer you know, remote capabilities that we have. Um, and, and that's a great thing about this industry that we work in. Very good. Does anyone in the audience have questions about, um, about the job search, the, the process, um, any of the concerns about onboarding, things that have been different in your own companies in terms of hiring or being able to bring new people in, or concerns about those workers when they are working remotely? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I work for uh, an MSSP, uh, so managed security service provider. So we provide those managed services for other clients. Um, we are investing more uh, with this COVID pandemic. Uh, it's actually uh, increasing uh, the, the demand. Uh, some of the stuff we heard about today with uh, insurance and the way attackers uh, and, and pressure is, is hitting these companies, they have to find solutions to that. Um, and uh, I believe as our keynote speaker mentioned, uh, managed services can be a great alternative to that. Um, and so, yeah, we're continuing to hire uh, a lot of entry-level positions for like security analysts, so monitoring security uh, tools, engineering those tools as like a system engineer, um, you know, implementing those changes that do protect you uh, up front uh, at, at your perimeters or even all the way down to your endpoints too. Um, so uh, analyst engineering uh, type roles, there is some uh, governance as, as well too um, because you can't really make any of those changes or enforce any of that stuff unless there's a, a policy there to, uh, to give the, the company that right to do that. So. Those are all very important key aspects um, that we are uh, hiring for currently. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, yes. Do we still have a microphone out there? I, there we go. Thank you. Uh, one of the good things with attending physically in the build in the companies is that we have access to the other experts and professionals so we can contribute our ideas and gain knowledge. So by uh, happening the COVID-19 pandemic, I see that uh, remote working is increasing. Uh, so what uh, facilities have you provided for the new employers which they need uh, gain experience? So Brian, can you speak to that um, in terms of how do you onboard people or what services do you provide to people, new people that you're bringing in, new hires, when you're bringing them in remotely? And especially since you were doing it before and you've been through that process as a remote employee. Yeah, what? yeah, and, and again, there's, there's a, a, a bright side to, to this and, and working remote as well. Um, we have fantastic technology like we're using here, uh, video conferencing technologies. 
Uh, that way you can, you can share facial expressions and you can share body language. Uh, that helps when you're onboarding somebody into a new team or a new company um, you know, to see what, what you're getting yourself into. A lot of times you, you don't necessarily get the full, you know, full picture of an organization or the culture of an organization through the interviews. You know, it's part of the, the interview process, but really getting embedded into an organization uh, it can, can still happen very effectively with video conferencing tools. Um, and then it's important uh, as you're bringing on new teammates to uh, make sure they have somebody to go to. Um, you know, no, we're not in the situation where you could go walk around the corner and go up to somebody's desk and ask for help anymore. Um, and it's, it can feel a little more intrusive when you inst or direct message somebody uh, you know, throughout the workday or you see that their icon says that they're in a meeting. So there's a little bit of, of you know, nuances there to walk through. But what I found to be helpful is to you know, just reassure those, those new team members that, you know, that they have somebody to go to. You know, whenever you need something, just let me know. Be available to them. Uh, that, that goes a long way, especially when you're remote. Um, and, and talk about, hey, I'm available pretty much all the time. If I don't respond within 24 hours, feel free to you know, follow up with me because we're all busy, right? We don't intend to forget things, but things get missed. Um, so give them that confidence to then send a follow-up email, still waiting on this. Uh, and that helps business keep moving, uh, helps the, the new employees feel welcome. They have somebody to go to and help. Um, so. Um, that's, I mean, I've gone full, full interviewing, onboarding, training. They're on their own, doing their own thing, uh, full remote. Uh, it's very well handled. Uh, it's, it's a fun experience, um, even dealing with uh, audio issues and stuff. Those can be fun. <laughs> you know, a little bit of icebreaker. Uh, you, you have those situations, too. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a fun time. And thankfully, we have these technologies that make it uh, you know, so we can do these things. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think I heard that one or two students are still looking for a position. Mm -hmm. I'd really love to hear what is your dream job? If you could walk out and all of a sudden you're hired by a firm, what does that look like? As an employer, I always like to know what what's in their heads, especially if they're just graduating and just going out into the field. What, what's your dream job? Um, I'm not sure what my dream job would be exactly, but I do enjoy to program. So if my job involves programming, that would be happy. Yeah, I'll say like my angle would be try to since I'm going for the MBA, to bridge that gap of businesses, I mean, of the business side and the IT side to be maybe a potential IT manager in the very end. I'll be the almost end goal, but like get started with any networking or security type job and then work your way up to eventually maybe 10, 15 years of working. You get that director of IT or IT manager, so you manage your whole department. And that's what I feel like also why I went back for the MBA just to help bridge that gap because if some if some people in the business like in accounting or finance don't know how important IT is or what te what technologies they can bring to help them save money of just trying to bridge that gap is just anything possible is what I would like to do uh, kind of like Tucker I find myself struggling to really say what my dream job would be um, I'm interested in things like the governance, risk, and compliance, um, looking at the management side of things, looking at uh, instituting policies, training people, that sort of thing. And also the more technical side of things, um, though it is somewhat of a difficult question to ask just because, especially for me, since I've only had the one internship, it's, it's really hard to say what is a realistic expectation, that sort of thing. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, as of right now, I'm not sure what my exact dream goal is, but I think doing grad school at UC, uh, one of my goals is to kind of navigate, figure out 
maybe what area I want to end up. Okay. But I do know that whatever it is, I really do want to help make it back. And I know at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, I would have been working behind the scenes, but it would have still been towards their goal of healthcare. Just makes them a part of it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions from other folks? I've got the microphone. Happy to bring it to you. Lynn. Oh, it helps if we have it that way because it's being recorded. So we appreciate you using the microphone. Thank you. So with internships being canceled, as you know, you guys talked about and I've seen personally myself, um, I know many businesses and organizations have been offering, um, you know, it's not this year, but you guys have first, you know, opportunity for the next year, assuming that it can go, go back to normal. So for those who are, let's say you were a junior, you applied and okay, you'd be a senior. So are you looking to get a full-time job right after college, or do, would you get the internship, then a full-time job? But for those who are like later down the ladder, does that lessen their opportunity since they will then have to wait potentially an extra year to get another internship? Does that make sense? Like, if it almost puts it back a year, like they have been doing with sports, as in, you know, the seniors who graduated are given another season. So when does that necessarily catch up? Do you want to talk to that, Brian? Yeah, um, just so being at an MSSP, I also get the, the privilege to work with lots of other organizations too. Uh, it's, it's a rare experience, you know, just to see how different companies respond to this uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a very business intimate kind of way. Uh, so watching this uh, to that point, I, I think, there was an initial shock that we all had when, when this pandemic first started, and they had, businesses had to quickly start to evaluate the, you know, the revenue streams and, and what does this look like moving forward. Um, they had to make some adjustments, like uh, reducing internships and, and maybe even headcounts at times. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think things have the, the, the initial panic has started to go away a little bit. We, we're, we're trending better, we're getting better uh, you know, numbers in, in various forms. And so I think that initial panic may, I'm hoping also, that, but I think that what I'm starting to see is that initial panic is starting to ease up and starting to return back to more opportunities. Uh, so I don't necessarily think it will be like a cascading event like you like you talked about there. Uh, and I, I think there could be some opportunities for even more internships and growth uh, after the fact as well too. Um, so that, that's, I've seen some of that. I, that's, again, nobody's told me that, so I don't know that for a fact, but it's, it's what I think I'm seeing and what I feel like. Um, so maybe some optimism there. And I'll add to that, and, and I think that's a very good point, and I think it does happen when things start to pick back up, they do, and, and it's not necessarily a full cycle. I also can tell you from many years of supervising internships and students seeking experiential learning that sometimes the economy is bad and there's not a whole lot of internships. Sometimes getting that next job is, is tough, and so people take jobs somewhere else along the way until they get that, that job that's really in the field that they want. Um, but during those times, the students also can be more creative about taking on additional um, opportunities within the community. So um, we have a local cybersecurity exploring post from the scouts, and so getting involved with helping show leadership there. So it's not necessarily a paid internship, but it's an experience that shows that chance for leadership, that chance for mentoring others, and that can look very favorable when students are, are applying for those jobs and trying to get that one opportunity if you've done something unusual. Um, Sawa has taken on an outreach coordinator position um, in the women in engineering group at um, UC, and so she's taking on additional opportunities, so she may not have internships that are gonna speak to you know, the Cleveland Clinic kind of experience she was hoping for, but she's got additional things that she's done um, that helps. So each one of them, as they add on to those credentials, and, and this has been true when the job market was down, um, students that take on leadership roles in, in campus organizations or community organizations add to their resume in ways that, that can help 
give similar experiences to things that you might learn in a job situation. So those are good opportunities as well. And Dr. Snyder, if I might add to that too, um, that when, when I was interviewing and recruiting and, and looking for individuals to grow our team, uh, that was one thing that I, I definitely looked for, especially uh, for somebody that may be transitioning to a new role. Uh, maybe they, they had a background in engineering and now they want to do cybersecurity, or maybe they have a background in psychology. Now they want to come into the cybersecurity field. Uh, you look for those 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 I you know those things that what are you doing you know to, to push yourself in that direction? You know what are you showing that you're passionate about here? Um, and that's I, I use those opportunities. You know maybe they weren't the highest paid. They're not very glamorous, but it shows that that you have a passion and a drive for this. Uh, so those things can definitely help. You know, I'll add one more comment, like, I used to like maybe that they get a year back or whatever. I don't think that matters because you're, as long as you can make a good first impression and your resume can at least get your, get the conversation going, that's all that really matters because it's more about the interview skills and how can you sell yourself and also give yourself confidence that you are the right person for this internship. Maybe someone has maybe more experience or more skills than you, but if you can just talk your way and get your foot into the door with your resume, you can maybe close that gap or even put you ahead if you can interview well and know how to handle certain problems, problems in certain situations. Very good. Okay. Any other comments there? I'm always encouraging students to do those extra things because they can make a big difference in, in people's impressions. Other questions? Other comments? All right. We are, we are very happy that you joined us today for the, the 19th Annual Information Assurance Forum. We do hope you'll keep in mind the 20th anniversary next year. If you have ideas about things we can do to celebrate and make it a big celebration, curing COVID would be great. Yes, Lynn. <laughs> and as we end today, I also want to say thank you from the Centercom and Highland, and thank you to Helen and her team here. Um, this was the first year we did this format. And these folks were amazing. We did it in person. We did it with UF TV live stream. And we did presentation with Zoom. Amazing teamwork. So uh, word of wisdom to all of you folks that are asking questions about employers and that sort of thing. The idea of being able to work in a team and pull things like this off and having them involved and putting that on your resume, I second third, fourth, whatever you want to say, I agree with that. Makes a huge difference. But we would be remiss if we didn't say thank you to all the folks under the University of Finley umbrella that made this happen. So kudos to all of you, and we are extremely grateful for that. Last point, over on the right-hand side, my right-hand side, we have mugs, we have different things. I would really appreciate it if all the students or anybody else that's here would Please pick up those things. I know, Susan, you don't want to take it back to Centricom. We brought that along so that we could share, and we really would appreciate it if you just take a look on your way out and see if there's something there that would be of interest to you. Uh, Helen, again, you're the linchpin for these events. Kudos to you. I think you deserve a standing ovation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. I am very fortunate to work with some really amazing people and, and the community and the university partnership in these, this event is really amazing because we really do have a lot of support and a lot of, of good collaboration and we it's do. been a, a real joy to work with, with all of the people involved. So and, many, many thanks. And Helen, I think uh, along the way, we also had some additional folks. We do have additional sponsors. sponsors. that we should at least acknowledge and make yes. sure that, that. And as I say, we had slides that have them. I don't know, can we get to that, that first PowerPoint set? Just to make we sure. We were having some technical difficulties at the time, so the slides didn't get all of their, their due time up on the screen, but we had um, sponsors from Whirlpool, from GSW, from Watchtower, from, I can almost remember all of them. Um, certainly Centricom and Highlands were, were major sponsors this year and helped with the and organizing. The treasurer's and, office, and Steve running. Welton. And uh, right, the, the mm -hmm. Hancock County Treasurer's Office, absolutely, Steve Welton. And did I forget one? I feel like I forgot one. All right, 
right, next slide. Wait, hang, hang on, wait One for it. More. It'll come up in a second. You can see the main, there, there it is, go. right there. <laughs> oh, and the radio stations, I forgot Absolutely. the radio stations. And SG Tech, and SG Tech has been one of our sponsors all along. And again, this is part of that evidence of the support from the community. We put this event on and we get that support from sponsors who feel that this is a worthwhile activity. So they will go through and give us donations to help sponsor the cost of the lunches and the um, all of the parts and pieces that go into putting this event together. So we absolutely appreciate our sponsors and there they are again on the bottom of the slides. And that information will be on the iaforum.net site. We'll get some information up about the links to the recordings so that you can see that information afterwards. And we will also um, make sure that you can see the, the save the date for next year's forum as well. So thank you very much. Um, please take advantage of the, the things at the Centricom table and um, Stop and talk, of course, socially distanced if you uh, would like to make connections. And if anyone is, is interested in hiring people or wants to share business information or contacts, please feel free to give me your contact information. We'll get it out to the students. Or if you want to talk to students individually, stand by the door. There's our exit doors that get out that way. So um, please feel free to, to talk with the students as, as you like. I'm one another. Thank you very much for a very successful 19th Annual Information Assurance Forum. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Take care now.